West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Well, when your job is making decisions and the decisions you have to make are the most important decisions made in the United States of America, and you have been making those decisions for 18 years, it seems like the most difficult question you could ever be asked is, what is the hardest decision you have ever had to make as Chief Justice of the United States? Where would you begin to answer that question? There must have been so many very, 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 very hard decisions. Human lives at stake, human futures at stake, human possibilities at stake in these decisions. It turns out that is a very easy question for the Chief Justice who revealed just how coddled and insulated his life and work experience has been from his days at boarding school, then Harvard College, then Harvard Law School, on his very determined way to the Supreme Court. When he offered last night this shockingly shallow answer to that question, in 18 years, I'm asked, well, what was the hardest thing, what was the hardest decision I had to make in 18 years? Was it this First Amendment case? Was it that death penalty case? Was it some major separation of powers case? None of those. The hardest decision I had to make was whether to erect fences and barricades around the Supreme Court. Now, just in case you were wondering if the Catholic Chief Justice of the United States faces a difficult struggle against the teachings of his own church and the Pope when the Chief Justice orders the execution of prisoners facing the death penalty in this country, you now have the answer to that question. That stuff is easy for this Chief Justice. Doesn't matter to him how often the Pope preaches against the death penalty because the Chief Justice has no problem separating his church from the state when the state is on his orders putting a prisoner to death. John Roberts made the decision as a Supreme Court Justice to make it illegal for a 10-year-old girl who was raped to obtain an abortion in her state. And because of John Roberts' decision, that 10-year-old girl had to travel to another state, a hardship that obviously no one related to John Roberts would ever have to endure. There is not a member 
of that Supreme Court who would force a 10-year-old girl in their family to give birth to a child after being raped. That 10-year-old girl has already had to make more difficult decisions than John Roberts has ever had to make in his entire professional life. At 10 years old. In that speech last night, John Roberts said the Supreme Court standing open and unfenced last year when the Supreme Court began its Republican campaign to remove constitutional rights from the people of this country took its place as a building on Capitol Hill as the symbol of this country's faith. He used the word faith, that the Supreme Court building, open and unfenced, was the symbol of this country's faith. The Chief Justice revealed himself yesterday more than he has ever revealed himself publicly. We should all encourage more of this kind of public speaking by the Chief Justice and the other justices so that the mentality of the born rich American aristocrats like John Roberts on the court can be exposed. Just as the Supreme Court has now been exposed under John Roberts' watch as wandering through the single most publicly corrupt period of the Supreme Court's history. John Roberts offered the weakest possible defense of the Supreme Court's low ethical standards, which has held the lowest ethical standards of any governing body in the federal government. I want to assure people that I am committed to making certain that we as a court adhere to the highest standards of conduct. We are continuing to look at things we can do to give practical effect to that commitment. And I am confident there are ways to do that that are consistent with our status as an independent branch of government under the Constitution's separation of powers. You can see the obliviousness there. John Roberts is completely oblivious to how wildly out of control the ethics standards at the Supreme Court have become because of Clarence Thomas's flagrant use of private jets and yachts in violation of the disclosure requirements of the Supreme Court justices, and also because of John Roberts' wife's $10 million income from selling her services to many of the major law firms in the country who have interests in the outcome of Supreme Court cases. John Roberts has not made a single sacrifice to be Chief Justice of the United States. His personal income at the court is limited by law, defined by law, but his wife's is not. And so, on the salary of a Supreme Court Justice, he lives the life of a fabulously wealthy man married to a very high-earning wife. John Roberts will never do anything about the corruption of Republican appointed Supreme Court justices and he will never do anything to correct the possible conflicts of interest and appearance of conflict of interest that his wife's massive income derived from law firms presents for the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice and his wife will never live by the ethical standard established by the Vice President and her husband. Vice President Kamala Harris, husband Doug Emhoff, was a very high-earning partner in a very powerful Los Angeles law firm with offices around the world. When Doug Emhoff's wife was elected Vice President of the United States, even though his personal legal practice mostly involved entertainment law and could present no possible conflict with the Vice President's work, Doug Emhoff decided to quit his job. He drastically cut his income to become a law professor 
at a local Washington law school. An ethical choice available to the Chief Justice's wife, but because the Chief Justice and his wife have assigned to themselves a much lower ethical standard than the Vice President and her husband, John Roberts is just going to force the country to live with the constant potential for conflict of interest with the way his wife makes him an even richer man than the wealth he was born into. In John Roberts' glancing reference to maintaining the low ethical standards of the Supreme Court, you just heard the Chief Justice stress, quote, our status as an independent branch of government under the Constitution's separation of powers. And there, he's trying to imply that the Congress of the United States has absolutely no right to legislate the ethics of the Supreme Court. But as the Chief Justice knows, the Congress has every right to do that and has already done that in the most minimal ways. For example, John Roberts could not be paid a lecture fee for his speech yesterday because Congress made that illegal for Supreme Court justices. Congress did that, not the Supreme Court. And now we know, now we know, it's all worse than we thought, much worse. That's what John Roberts proved last night. Until last night, John Roberts had enjoyed the public image of being possibly <clears throat> the most thoughtful Republican appointed member of the Supreme Court. And the terrible truth might be that he is the most thoughtful Republican appointed member of the Supreme Court. We now know that he's not just a Republican politician. He is a small-minded thinker who has no idea of the pain and anguish, the cruelty of his decisions have, has inflicted on people, including 10-year-old girls. And the only pain and anguish he seems to be capable of feeling in his job is when he gazes out his office window and sees the fence that he feels he was forced to erect to keep the sounds of the pain and anguish he has inflicted on other people as far from his tender ears as possible. It is Thursday, the 25th of May of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is our door person, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Indeed. Yes, uh, how are you on this fine Thursday? It looks like the uh, DeSantis rollout um, uh, went out flat, apparently. And you would expect that from a social media platform that has been decimated to its core. How's that for a cliche, huh? Huh? <laughs> it's early in the morning here still. Anyway, um, it's, uh, it's, it's nice when you see it. <laughs> like we're not ready for prime time just like we've been telling everybody but wait until they find someone who is and uh, maybe Ron DeSantis is good enough he's good enough or as we used to hear on the job site good enough for government work yeah well we'll see because government isn't anything like business even though they want to make it like a business again, I have to remind folks, every business I worked for, they made it implicitly clear it was not a democracy. That's why they want to run government like a business. They don't like democracy. They've been telling us that ever since we started working. God. Now they want little kids to work, and we got a story about that 
Yeah, you know, it's one thing to sort of like, okay, you can have a part-time job. <laughs> but I don't know. We're going to fill we're going to fill labor shortages. All right. Well, we had, you know, a pretty good workforce, but you guys didn't want to help them become, you know, productive citizens because you don't like the hue of their hue. Okay. So uh, the brouhaha here in Rogue River, Oregon continues. Um, Now, Facebook on its own, not the administrators on the community page, because I got to say, I'm surprised that some of this has still stayed up. Maybe the administrator's out of town and he hasn't seen it. And when he does, heads will roll, including my own. Anyway, um, this uh, fellow from town who uh, went to uh, a a multiracial, multi gender identifying household on kind of a rural part of town, and walked up this long gravel driveway to berate the family for having a pride flag, a rainbow flag, in their yard. That apparently that was some sort of a front. Now, this is a town that flies. Uh, once again, I got to remind folks, I'm sorry, it's early in the morning, but here we go. Flies actual fuck Biden flags, not let's go Brandon. I mean, there's plenty of those. But actual fuck Biden flags right across the street from the elementary school. <sighs> so I guess. That gives him suker to go onto someone else's property and berate them about their, I don't know, cultural, political ideologies. Now, you know, of course, that if you or I went onto someone's property flying a fuck Biden flag and attempted to knock on their door to berate them about their sentiments, we'd be shot. It's probably through the door. They wouldn't even open it up. And they would claim stand your ground and it would probably hold. Even in Oregon, that's supposedly blue. Not this part of Oregon, mind you. And when you deal with the cops in Portland, you kind of wonder, like, what the hell is up? Sure aren't liberal. So, um... Yeah, of course, the usual suspects are all irate because, you know, there's this guy, Brad Smith, a journalist here in town. He's got, you know, like a show on public radio and he wrote for the local Rogue River Press uh, a while ago. But, you know, so many people complained because his reporters didn't uh, toe the line. So we get to rehash the behavior of members of our little town. When our city hall, our city council invited a black woman to give us, to give a a presentation on our Thursday workshop day about racism. And the then police chief got all bent out of shape, says, there's no such thing as racism. You're trying to say we're racist. Didn't give her a chance to even begin pretty much intimidated her. Other members of the community were appalled at the way she was treated. So we tried to put together, well, we'll just, you know, we'll we'll have this workshop at a picnic and we'll have it at Palmerton Park, which is, you know, a city park uh, across the little river uh, or the little creek called Evans Creek. Sometimes it's not so little. And uh, no, that wasn't couldn't do that either. Because certain members of the community said they're trying to call us all racist. No, they're not. Why is it that the bigots always whine the loudest about being bigots? It's not all of the town that's being bigoted. Only the raging bigots are. Okay, please. And I wish people would realize that if you're raging about being called a raging bigot, ah, you might want to look inward a little bit. But that's impossible, looking inward. That's for flakes, snowflakes. That's for liberal commies. Empathy. 
damn your empathy. F your empathy. But apparently, uh, this Brad Smith has been an instigator of violence. I like that. The biggest want to hurt people, and it's the journalist instigating it. Really, is that how it works? Who is the instigator? In this incident about a black woman being invited by the town, the city council, to give a workshop on racism, and our then police chief calls up his friends, and over a hundred line up across the street from City Hall, and now they're, uh, uh, I, I mentioned that they were armed, which, which they were. I mean, there's actual newspaper and uh, media photos, not just Brad Smith. Because we are in an open carry state and these people wear their guns like, I don't know, a cross around their neck. Trying to tell me they were unarmed. They were armed and they were flashing their giant guns on their hips. And they're bent out of shape because apparently Brad Smith called the whole town a bunch of Klan members backward races. Not the whole town. Only the raging bigots. And if you're defending the raging bigots, I, I, I think maybe, you know, you're, you're proving the argument. That's what I'm trying to get across. So, yeah, they're, they're raging. <laughs> it's only a matter of time before I get suspended. And it might be just from regular Facebook because apparently uh, being very civil is an instigating factor. It's an instigating behavior. You're, you being nice is causing them to be mean. So you're the bad person. Oh, really? Is that how fascism works? Yes, it exactly is how it works. The victimization, even when you're trying to empathize, empathy is a weakness to them. Oh, we've always known this. I mean, it's in the uh, Nazi playbook, you know. Jeez. Read the rise and fall of the Third Reich. You know, as flawed as that might be, I'm still. Okay, as that's going on, we do have a curated show for you today. So why don't we get into it and move along? And at the top, yeah, when asked what was his hardest decision, old balls and strikes Chief Justice Roberts fenced himself in. See what I did there? On the rest of the menu, Klamath County, Oregon Public Library book clubs have been canceled because a resident complained it was indoctrination. Uh, what? Okay. Republican state lawmakers want children to fill labor shortages, even in bars and on school nights. And a Republican investigation found Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton committed multiple crimes, including felonies, over many years in office. A Republican investigation. Something's going on in Texas. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the sophisticated Pegasus spyware has been turned on the Mexican president's inner circle. And it looks like it's the Mexican president doing it. And Western intelligence agencies say Chinese hackers are spying on critical U.S. infrastructure. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who will be attending Netroots Nation in Chicago this year. So we look forward to that. Thank you, Kelly. If you would look across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you'll notice the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help. If you could send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, it helps us pay our bills and all the other costs, which are kind of like bills that uh, are incurred while running this powerhouse of resistance. And uh, your patronage, recurring patronage, by the way, helps us uh, fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. So we, we, we do. We thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, though we're bugging out of Twitter, and you know why, uh, you can do so by going to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that and a lot more. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon and Spoutable at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Coast 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, you can always find the show notes and links by following my social media feed. And you can read the actual articles in which we are, shall we say, Sampling from sampling. You can also follow the show on Twitter, such as it is at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, Tune, and I YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. They're everywhere. Get them. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Shelley Leggett. From local TV station, Kobe 5, K-O-B-I. In early May, a Klamath County Library book club was canceled after complaints from residents. They were upset about a book being featured by the club called No More Police, A Case for Abolition. The The library group is called the Social Justice Book Group, and was created in September of 2022. Every month, the group discusses a non-fiction book and has group discussions. At a meeting on May 3rd, library officials said, Klamath County commissioners told the library it could not endorse or sponsor any political position in this group or ones like it. As a result... The library leader said they had to cancel the book group until further notice. They said after this, they're concerned about the future of other educational and civic events. It was emotional, and I think the decision was a little abrupt. That's why I'm waiting to see what's going to happen next. I'm hoping that we will still be able to continue the same kind of programming that we've been doing for so many years, said the director of Klamath County Library Service District, Natalie Johnston. The Library Advisory Board had an emergency meeting where the public weighed in on the situation. Many asked for the library to continue with the group and programs like it. The advisory board also wrote a letter to the Klamath County Board of Commissioners in response, but said they have not heard back. Kobe 5 also reached out to the commissioners for comment, but no comment was given.
Tom Van Wiesen of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Lawmakers in several states are embracing legislation to let children work in more hazardous occupations, longer hours on school nights, and in expanded roles, including serving alcohol in bars and restaurants as young as age 14. The efforts to significantly roll back labor rules are largely led by Republican lawmakers to address worker shortages and, in some cases, run afoul of federal regulations, do you think? Child welfare advocates worry the measures represent a coordinated push to scale back back hard-won protections for minors. You mean since even before Teddy Roosevelt? Lawmakers proposed loosening child labor laws in at least 10 states over the past two years, according to a report published last month by the Left-Leaning Economic Policy Institute. Is that how it's described? Some bills became law while others with were withdrawn or vetoed. Legislators in Wisconsin, Ohio, and Iowa are actively considering relaxing child labor laws to address worker shortages. Employers have struggled to fill open positions after a spike in retirements, deaths, and illnesses from COVID-19, decreases in legal immigration, and other factors. Wisconsin lawmakers back a proposal to allow 14-year-olds to serve alcohol in bars and restaurants, scantily clad 14-year-olds. If passed, Wisconsin would have the lowest such limit nationwide, according to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Oh, obviously a woke group. The Ohio legislature is on track to pass a bill allowing students ages 14 and 15 to work until 9 p.m. during the school year with parents' permission. That's later than federal law allows, so a companion measure asks the U.S. Congress to amend its own laws. Under the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, students that age can only work until 7 p.m. during the school year. Congress passed the law in 1938 to stop children from being exposed to dangerous conditions and abusive practices in mines, factories, farms, and street trades. Bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Republican-led investigation on Wednesday yesterday accused Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton of committing multiple crimes in office, including felonies, during an extraordinary public airing of scandal and alleged law-breaking that plunged one of the GOP's conservative stars into new political and illegal risk. For more than three hours, investigators presented findings alleging Paxton sought to hide an affair, misuse his office to help a donor, skirted protocols grossly outside norms, and built a culture of fear and retaliation in his office. Investigators told the 
GOP-led House General Investigating Committee that there was evidence that Paxton repeatedly broke the law over the years, including by misusing official information, abusing his official capacity and retaliation. The dramatic turn of events in the Texas Capitol unleashed a new test of Paxton's durability in a way he has not previously confronted despite a felony indictment in 2015 and an ongoing FBI investigation. The House Committee's investigation has been quietly going on for months and did not come to light until Tuesday. The committee ended Wednesday's hearing without acting on the findings. The panel is led by Republican State Representative Andrew Murr, who afterward declined to discuss the next steps or whether a recommendation to impeach or censor Paxton was possible. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, and welcome to Your Health Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. On this show, we highlight the latest vital health news, discoveries that affect your body and your mind. Every episode, we dive into one topic. We discuss diseases, treatments, and some controversies. And we demystify the medical research in ways you can use to stay healthy. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We're Scientific American Senior Health Editors. On today's show, the official COVID public health emergency ended this month. What will that mean to you? Will it change how you get vaccines, tests, and treatments? Will it change how much you pay for them? And how will you hear warnings about new COVID waves? The COVID pandemic isn't over, but many of the official emergencies are. A few weeks ago, the U.S. government ended its public health emergency, which has been in place since early 2020. And the World Health Organization announced the disease, quote, no longer constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. It's important to keep in mind that the virus still poses a threat. In the middle of May, about 4,000 people per day were being hospitalized with COVID in the U.S., and more than 800 were dying each week. But the end of the U.S. public health emergency indicates those numbers have dropped a lot from the time when thousands died every day. And those counts continued to go down. Tentatively, I'd say we're trending in the right direction. I was wondering, though, if the U.S. declaration is going to change everyone's access to things that people still need. Take vaccines and COVID tests. For years, the vaccines have been free, and so have most rapid home tests. The emergency let the government set rules on prices and insurance coverage. I don't know if that's going to change now. Fortunately, we do know someone who can tell us. Indeed. Our colleague, Lauren Young, Siam's associate health editor, just wrote a story on this exact subject. So we asked her to come on the show and bring everyone up to speed. Hi, Lauren. Hey, Tanya. Hey, Josh. Welcome to Your Health Quickly. It's great to have you here. It's really great to be here. Thanks for having me. So jumping right in, can you tell us what ending the public health emergency is going to do to COVID health treatments? What's going to happen to vaccines to start with? Right. So those shots are a really big deal. COVID vaccines absolutely improved people's protection against the virus and changed the course of the pandemic. Ever since they were made available in 2021, they have been completely free for everyone who wanted one, regardless of whether you had insurance or the type of insurance you had. This is because the federal government has purchased nearly 2 billion doses of COVID vaccines and 171 million bivalent boosters. Those are the ones that are formulated to cover Omicron strains. So healthcare providers can't deny any eligible person a vaccine or booster purchased on the government's dime, and they can't charge you any out-of-pocket costs. That's great news. So there's a stockpile, essentially. But what happens when that runs out? Well, if the government decides not to replenish it, then any cost you may have to pay will depend on your insurance. 
people on most private insurances and certain Medicare programs should still be able to receive vaccines from in-network providers with no out-of-pocket costs. Medicaid members will have their vaccines covered without co-pays through September 30th, 2024. That's also true for any future boosters recommended by the CDC. Say I didn't have insurance. What might I have to pay? Right. Well, so Pfizer and Moderna, two of the major vaccine developers, have hinted that commercial prices would be between $110 and $130 per dose. That's about three to four times higher than the discounted rate the government paid per dose. There is some good news, though, for people without insurance. The Health and Human Services Department announced a $1.1 billion program to continue to provide COVID vaccines, along with certain antiviral treatments like Paxlovid, to people who don't have insurance. That money is expected to last through December 2024. Okay, now I have private insurance, a group plan through Siam. You think I won't have to pay anything if there's, say, a new fall booster shot? Not even those $20 copays I sometimes have to fork over for prescriptions? Right. So I had the same exact question because I'm on that same plan. Uh, So we won't have to pay anything, even co-pays for the vaccine or future boosters, as long as we get them from an in-network provider. COVID vaccines will likely transition to a seasonal program, so coverage would be similar to your typical flu vaccine. The experts I spoke to suspect many other private insurance companies are going to do the same thing. Is the same thing true for treatments like Paxlovid? Pretty much. So the government also stocked up on these drugs and medications, which will continue to be free for people no matter what your insurance status is. But again, once those supplies run out, your insurance will have to cover the price. I've heard that many private health insurers have already stopped covering all of the out-of-pocket costs for COVID hospital visits and treatments. They're basically treating COVID like any other disease. Yeah, that's totally right. But people on government insurance programs with drug coverage, like Medicare or Medicaid, they won't have to pay anything for a while. Medicare will be free indefinitely, while Medicaid will make treatments free until September 30th, 2024. And then coverage will be determined by state. Let's talk about COVID tests. I've been getting free at-home antigen tests from the government through the mail. I also got free ones from my local library, and my insurance plan paid for some that I picked up at the drugstore. But now all of that's changing. Private insurance companies are no longer required to cover at-home tests and lab tests. Yeah, so it's really up to your insurance plan. They decide whether costs will continue to be covered completely or if you'll have to pay any or all of the fees. COVID tests will likely be treated similarly to other screening tests like your blood sugar or your cholesterol tests. If you're uninsured, you've probably been paying for COVID tests out of pocket already, even before the public health emergency ended. Yeah, that started in the middle of last year when a lot of the COVID relief funds and reimbursement programs began to end. So my understanding is that Medicaid is different because each state has its own program. Those programs should cover tests without charge until September 30th, 2024, and then after that, it'll depend on what states decide. For Medicare recipients, if your doctor or healthcare provider orders a COVID PCR test, that will still be covered. At-home tests, though, are a different story. They are. So for a home test, Medicare members will have to pay, like people with private insurance. I did some price checking. At most drugstores and retailers, at-home testing kits range between $10 and $40. So my insurance won't pay for any of that? Yeah, that's right. In general, you can probably expect to spend more out-of-pocket on these tests than you did before. I have a bunch of tests at home, but a couple are close to the expiration date on the package. You know, they actually might still be good. The FDA has extended the shelf life on many tests after finding out that they retain their accuracy for longer periods. You can check for new dates on the FDA website. You just have to search for COVID-19 diagnostic tests. One other thing I've been very interested in as the emergency ends is how we're going to track COVID levels. The CDC has been emphasizing your level of community exposure as a way to figure out how careful to be. If there was a peak in cases or a certain level of hospitalizations, consider wearing a high-quality mask in crowded indoor spaces and stuff like that. But the CDC is changing what it reports now, right? It won't ask local health departments to report positive test rates, transmission levels, and total cases. That's right. The CDC has been one of the major sources of COVID case data, but it's now going to lean on COVID death rates, emergency room data, and hospital admissions for its primary national surveillance measurements. This is partly because some of the data for case rates were sort of unreliable. They became questionable when people began using more widely available at-home COVID tests. The CDC says weekly COVID hospitalization rates are better indicators of local outbreaks at this point. Okay, so 
Where can people find those local hospitalization numbers? Local city and state public health departments have this information. You can also find hospitalizations by county and state on the CDC's COVID data tracker. And there's another place to search for outbreak warnings, the sewer. Epidemiologist Caitlin Jettelina recently suggested in her newsletter that people follow local and regional wastewater trends, and that data will still be coming in. Wastewater analysis is a really strong tool for identifying and tracking variants and monitoring transmission. It's a really good idea. Wastewater numbers measure the amount of the COVID-causing virus found in sewage, which is a pretty good proxy for the number of infected people. So if numbers are going up in your area, you should probably start taking precautions like masking. Yeah, I think that's pretty sound advice. You can find COVID wastewater surveillance data on the CDC's data tracker. That's really good to know. In fact, all in all, I feel like I know a lot more than I did 10 minutes ago. Me too. And if you want even more info, check out Lauren's story online at Siam.com. Great talking with you, Lauren. Thanks so much for having me. Your Health Quickly is produced by Talika Bose, Jeff Del Vicio, and Kelso Harper. It's edited by Ella Fetter and Alexa Lim. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Our show is part of Scientific American's podcast, Science Quickly. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, give us a rating or review. And if you have ideas for topics we should cover, send us an email at yourhealthquickly at siam.com. That's yourhealthquickly at siam.com. And don't forget to go to siam.com for updated and in-depth health news. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Warning. This Civil Liberties Minute contains a gruesome description of a mass murder. I'm Bill Newman, and we'll give another second here for people to turn off their radios. Recently, the editor-in-chief of The Week magazine, William E. Falk, described a police officer rushing to the scene of a mass shooting in Allen, Texas, coming upon bloody torn bodies scattered on the ground next to the dead killer and his assault rifle, including a little girl whose face was no longer. No mainstream publication, including his, the editor wrote, would publish such photos for many reasons. The need for family consent, preserving the dignity of the dead, and the sensibility of readers. But then the editor recalled the importance of images in our history. The photo of Emma Till, the image of the nine-year-old Vietnamese girl burned by napalm, the photos of Iraqis tortured at Abu Ghraib, the George Floyd video. The editor raised the question whether the media's withholding gruesome images from mass murders is anesthetizing the public, whether that self-censorship serves the interest of reporting the news as the country continues to consider what action, if any, to take with regard to rapid-fire, high-capacity assault rifles. He raises the question whether that self-censorship is something we, the public, actually need and deserve or want. After all, if we really don't want to look, we can turn the page or turn off the TV or the radio. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1986. That was the day that more than 5 million people participated in hands across America. The event was organized to raise money to combat the problems of homelessness and hunger in the United States. 
people agreed to donate $10 to stand in their place in line for 15 minutes. The line was supposed to link people hand in hand from New York City through 17 states to Long Beach, California. The event gained support of corporate donors, including the Coca-Cola Company and Citibank. Initially, the plan drew the ire of President Ronald Reagan, who claimed, quote, I don't believe that there is anyone going hungry in America by reason of denial or lack of ability to feed them. It is by people not knowing where or how to get this help. The president refused to acknowledge how factors like the loss of industrial jobs and the decline of labor unions contributed to families having hard times making ends meet. Eventually, President Reagan got on board, forming part of the chain in Washington, D.C. He was joined in line across the country by everyone from Oprah to Chewbacca and Mickey Mouse. The event was projected to raise $50 million, but not everyone turned in their pledge contributions and staffing costs ate into profits. In the end, the project raised about $20 million. In 2015, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development reported that there were more than 500,000 people homeless in the United States. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the mid-80s, plentiful sunshine throughout the day, winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, clear skies overnight with lows in the low 50s with winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, and then sunshine tomorrow, highs once again in the mid-80s, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Grass pollen is the predominant pollen that's infecting our area right here in Rogue River itself, and it's rated very high. Uh, the air quality index for the region is in the good range at 21 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is very high at level 8, so do take care. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.91 inches, visibility is up to 9 miles, and... Relative humidity is at 87%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that's why it's called the Weather Underground. London is 62 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 71 and sunny. Rome is 76 degrees with heavy thunderstorms, and they have an advisory for electrical disruptions because of that thunderstorm, but also a flash flood warning. Kiev is 76 degrees and partly cloudy. Kabul is 63 and clear. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and partly cloudy, and they've got a lot of humidity themselves. Tokyo is 65 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 62 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 54 and cloudy, and they continue to have a small craft advisory in the mornings because of heavy fog on the bay. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, 
Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Lopez and Mary Beth Sheridan of the Washington Post brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Mexico's security forces have been among the world's most aggressive in using cutting-edge surveillance technology to eavesdrop on the phones of opposition politicians, journalists, and human rights activists. Now, the sophisticated Pegasus spyware has been turned on members of the president's own team as it investigates alleged abuses by the military. Pegasus has been found on the cell phones of Alejandro Encinas, the Undersecretary for Human Rights in Mexico's government ministry, and at least two other people in his office. Citizen Lab a digital research center at the University of Toronto confirmed the presence of the malware on Encinas's phone via a forensic audit last year. Citizen Lab declined to comment, as did Encinas. The hack was first reported by the New York Times. President Obrador said Encinas had informed him that his phone had been bugged, but at his daily news conference on Tuesday, the president downplayed the high-tech attack and said he did not believe the army was at fault. Wink, wink. The surveillance is particularly striking because Encinas and Lopez Obrador have been close allies for decades since rising in prominence together as members of Mexico's leftist opposition. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Zeba Siddiqui and Christopher Bing of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A state-sponsored Chinese hacking group has been spying on a wide range of U.S. critical infrastructure organizations from telecommunications to transportation hubs, Western intelligence agencies, and Microsoft said... Yesterday, Wednesday, the espionage has also targeted the U.S. island territory of Guam, home to strategically important mil American military bases, Microsoft said in a report, adding that mitigating this attack could be challenging. While China and the U.S. routinely spy on each other, analysts say this is one of the largest known Chinese cyber espionage campaigns against American critical infrastructure. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said today that the hacking allegations were a collective disinformation campaign from the Five Eyes countries a reference to the intelligence-sharing grouping of countries made up of the United States, 
Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. Mao said the campaign was launched by the U.S. for geopolitical reasons and that the report from Microsoft analysts showed that the U.S. government was expanding its channels of disinformation beyond government agencies. But no matter what varied methods are used, none of this can change the fact that the United States is the empire of hacking, she told a regular press briefing in Beijing. It was not immediately clear how many organizations were affected, but the U.S. National Security Agency said it was working with partners including Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the U.K., as well as the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation to identify breaches. Canada, U.K., Australia, and New Zealand warned they could be targeted by the hackers, too. Microsoft analysts said they had moderate confidence this Chinese group, which it dubbed as Volt Typhoon, was developing capabilities that could disrupt critical communications infrastructure between the United States and the Asia region during future crises. It means they are preparing for that possibility, said John Holtquist, who has threat analysis at Google's Mandiant Intelligence. The Chinese activity is unique and worrying, also because analysts don't yet have enough visibility on what this group might be capable of, he added. There is greater interest in this actor because of the geopolitical situation. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Friday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golfe clair Ton bras les yeux ouverts Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Don't mange
jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 